So you're thinking about picking up Wizard 101 in 2023. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, but also, hey, welcome aboard. I recently soloed the first arc of this game without dying, something that most veteran players can easily do, but what are veteran Wiz players doing that the average new player isn't to make such a large chunk of the game so easy? Well, today I'm gonna detail chronologically from level one to level 50, how to start the game of Wizard 101 optimally and cheaply, the only membership required. I'm talking what side modes are worth your time, what you should spend or not spend your gold and training points on, the mechanics of the game, etc. Let's get into it. Starting off at level one, where everybody starts, classes, school selection, etc. What's right for you? Now, back in the day, if this, if I made this guide like five years ago, when the servers were dead, I would have said, hey, maybe stick to like these three here. Nowadays, it doesn't really matter. If you are stuck on a boss or if you're having trouble with a boss, team up is pretty populated nowadays. Odds are there's somebody else who also needs help on that boss. You'll be able to find a team up. It'll be fine. I feel like all these schools are in a pretty good spot right now for at least PVE content. They're all pretty good. So let's just go over what they do more so is how good they are. Hitters, fire, myth, storm, low health, a big damage. That's what they do. They do a lot of damage and they do it very, very quickly. Wizard 101 is a game where you're going to want to lean into your strengths. So Fire Myth Storm, your whole deal is going to be doing damage quickly, killing enemies, killing bosses as quickly as you possibly can. You're also susceptible to a lot of RNG or if you make a mistake, like say you're a new player and you make a mistake, there you don't have as much uh, health and resistance as a buffer to compensate for those mistakes, right? Ice, standing in a class of its own in the tank school. I think it's one of the more beginner friendly classes. I'd say like Ice, Life, Death are probably the three most beginner friendly classes. Ice is very beginner friendly because of its bulk. It is a tanky school. You have a lot of health, a lot of resistance. Therefore, you have a lot of room for mistakes. Ice's whole shtick is that they play the long game. Very little offense. You have probably the worst firepower in the entire game in terms of just pure damage numbers, but you got a lot of res, you got a lot of health. So you're gonna be going through the game a bit slower, but because of that slower pace, you're going to have more leeway to make mistakes. Ice, pretty beginner friendly, just slower than these three here. Supports, heals, buffs, etc. Balance is like the jack of all trades support. You have a ton of buffs. Literally any of these schools here can be buffed by balance. You also have heals and other other neat bits of utility that are very good. I would say if you're planning on primarily soloing, it's a bit complicated. A lot of people solo on balance is like the challenge run of a solo. Not the most beginner friendly school, but if you're playing in a group or you plan on using team up a lot, shouldn't be a big problem. You're not going to have to solo much anyway. Life you can solo with this one. Life is hella bulky, has a ton of sustain, a lot of health, a lot of healing. That's what they do. They're the healing school. That's why they're in the support class. They go all in on heals until, until you hit level 48. And once you hit level 48, you get Forest Lord and then you'd be suddenly a school with no weaknesses that hits pretty damn hard. Now you're not gonna be hitting as hard as these three here. Let's not get that twisted, but you're gonna be pretty damn close. So if you can get to level 48, you're gonna be a jack of all trades. It's gonna be great. One of the best schools in the game, but those first 48 levels are a bit slow. Now death is in a class of its own. For PVE in specific, death is easy mode. You do everything. If you look at like a chart based on HP and the like. Death kind of lies in the middle because ice balance life, they all got more HP. I think balance is around the same HP as death. Not the most bulky in that regard, but what makes them so bulky is that their hits drain health. And how that works is, say you have a vampire card, does like 400 points of damage. You hit an enemy, it sucks the life out of them, sucks the soul out of them, and you get 200 HP back. And it eliminates a lot of the thinking of the game, which is like, when should I heal? When should I hit? You don't have to worry about it. If you're ever in danger, hit the hit button and you're gonna get all your health back. Any critical situation you can possibly be in just gets erased, especially for these early parts of the game, levels one through 50, just by using a life draining hit. It's very good. All these schools are good. All these schools are very much playable. But now, hey, you made it through. You made it through Unicorn Way. You made it through the tutorial. Congratulations. But you've noticed, hey, I got this thing called training points. What the hell are these? What is a training point? And when do you get them? How do you get them? Training points are the resource that allows you to learn spells from schools that you did not select. So example, say you're a life wizard and you want to learn vampire or something, right? You need to spend training points to get vampire. It's a one-to-one -one exchange. However, you do need to keep in mind that if you want a specific spell in a spell tree, you need to get all of the prerequisites beforehand. So if I did want to get vampire, I would have to get dark sprite, ghoul, uh, whatever the, the set shield for death is called, and then maybe you get your vampire. It's a one-to-one -one exchange per spell, but you need to go all the way through the spell tree to get the one that you want, get all the prerequisites first. So now that we know what they are, when do you get them? Well. You get them once every four levels until level 20. 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. And then after that, every five levels, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. I'm not gonna get all the way to 160. I think you probably can get the point. One more way to get training points is the Prospector Zeke quests. That's this affable gentleman right here. You're gonna see him in every uh, major hub area of every world. And he's gonna give out a quest that looks like this. Find the Smiths is a good example. Basically, you have to find a set of creatures throughout a world. There's gonna be one scattered throughout most of the areas, and you just need to find all of them. You can find all of them while you're questing. It's basically an exploration quest, and once you find all of them, he's gonna give you an extra training point, sometimes some XP, sometimes some gold. It's a good time. There's plenty of guys that'll show you how to find them, exactly like pinpoint location where all of them are. Shout out Final Bastion, they got a lot of great guides there. But now that we know what they are, now that we know how to get them, we're gonna go over how to spend them properly. Now, this is school dependent, but what I'm gonna say, this is a rule that applies to every school. Don't spend 
spend it on a secondary school or opposite. Just don't do it. Like for example, say I'm an ice player and I just watched like two slides ago where it's like ice doesn't hit very hard. I can just learn storm spells and then hit everybody really hard. It doesn't work like that because your gear is not built towards hitting with other schools, right? Spells that you train from a storm school are not going to scale. They just won't because all the bonuses your gear gives you are going to be bonuses towards your own specific school. So that storm shark is not going to hit very hard at all. In fact, your ice spells are going to hit way harder once you get to like level 30, level 40. It's just, it doesn't scale well. It's a waste of training points and training points are a finite resource. You don't want to spend them on secondary schools or opposites. Go for utility over hits. The best utility, Faint, Seder, Blades, Elemental and Spirit Blades, level 25 in specific. You're going to want to get these as soon as possible. Faint and Seder are also things you're going to be want to get uh, using your training points on and sinking them into throughout the entire first 30 ish levels of the game. Faint is apparently level 22 now. Didn't know that. <laughs> All right, let me just uh, <laughs> let me just uh, let me just uh, faint at level 22, six training points. What a save. The comments would have lit my ass up if you did not say that, Jay guy. <laughs> but yeah, as I was saying, uh, and I was, uh, as I was always saying, uh, Elemental and Spirit Blades, you get access to them at level 25 from Niles at the Balance School from the Balance Tree. Get those as soon as possible. Once you level 25 and get that training point, get the one that applies to your school as soon as you can. Literally, the second you get that point, just put it in there. Having two blades is important for your gameplay loop. I would really recommend getting them. You're going to be pretty much using that blade in every single fight, at least for the first uh, 1 to 50 levels. I'd recommend getting it very much. Uh, Seder at level 26 costs seven training points and Faint at level 22, which I always knew by the way uh, that ignore the bracket I didn't finish <laughs> six training points but which one should you get that's a lot of training points shotgun I would have to get both of them at a timely manner so which one should you get here's what to spend it on and uh pretty much everybody these five here they're gonna want to get faint and just ignore Seder entirely because you don't need it myth fire storm you're gonna be hitting anyway your goal is to blitz through fights as quickly as you can you're trying to get your fights done as quickly as possible Seder is irrelevant get faint faint will help you kill bosses very quickly balance and life they get heals innately in their kit life literally trains Seder balance gets a veiling hands at some point and it's very very good so you don't need to spend really anything on Seder it's just a waste of time and a waste of points now ice is in a bit of a tricky situation here ice has a pretty rough trading point problem they need Seder and faint because your goal as an ice player is to play the long game you kind of need Seder for that extra sustainability that extra push and you also need faint to kill any boss in a reasonable amount of time at all. So which one do you go for first? I recommend going for Seder first because they did a few years ago nerf all, all of the health from all of the mobs and bosses. I don't think you'll need faint particularly to get through them in a reasonable amount of time until around second arc. Seder though, you might need at points, especially in tougher fights, but you're gonna need both at some point. I don't think there's a particularly wrong answer. If you wanna get faint before Seder, go for it. It'll treat you well. Now death again in a class of its own, neither. Why is it neither? Why is death so weird? Well, you don't need to heal because like, as I said earlier, you drain health with your hits. And also faint just comes naturally in your spell tree at level, at level 22. So what do you spend your points on when you have everything? What do you buy the guy that has it all? Well, you buy him tower shield. Tower shield, very good spell. It's something that you can dump your training points as a death player into early. It only costs, I believe five, you get a level 15, minus 50% to the next spell that hits you. So it basically acts as a protective measure against enemy hits. It's very good, but once you get tower shield, you don't need to get anything else. I know it's hard, it's a hard thing to do. Don't spend your training points after tower shield. It's only five, you're gonna get a lot of them. Just save until level 50, save until you get to Celestia, and then get your astral spells, get your sun spells, though sun spells in particular that boost damage and have a ball with your insane training point economy that none of these schools are gonna have. Now that we have all our spells, I am going to show you the basic gameplay loop of Wizard 101. Now this is just a regular mob fight. Starting off, we got a blade. That's basically how the gameplay works. <laughs> you're gonna wanna put a school blade down first or whatever blade you have in your hand first. And then you're gonna wanna stack your one pit blade. Regardless of what happens, you're gonna wanna have two blades on before you hit. As long as you have two blades, some schools don't. Shout out Ice who gets their blade at le level 38. But now you have your two blades, you press the AOE button and and you watch it go burn. And because I have two blades on, it's gonna kill. You're gonna see the crit doesn't power through on the other guy on the, I believe the far end there in the back. Doesn't crit on him, still dies anyway. Two blades, AOE, you do your thing. Now blade stacking and how it works is, it's a bit complicated because obviously different blades stack. For example, an elemental blade is going to stack with a storm blade, but also what kind of isn't told to you by the game and isn't like apparently obvious, the same blade gotten from a different source will also stack. So if I have a regular storm blade and a storm blade that is given to me by a piece of gear or a pet, that is gonna stack with a regular storm blade. Blades from different sources that are technically the same spell still stack. So a treasure card storm blade will stack, a regular storm blade will stack, different sources, 
stack along with different cards. It's a bit complicated, but that's the best way I think I can explain it. Let's get to the side modes. We know how to play the regular game. What are the side modes that you really should be doing? Here are the needs, the ones that you really should do. Gardening, you get gardening level 12, start as soon as you can. You get those two starter seeds from uh, the gardening mole man. I think his name's Farley. He gives you some seeds, plant those seeds, get the experience, get to rank three, farm for couch potatoes. When you get to Grizzleheim at level 20 and you plant them. And the reason you farm for couch potatoes and plant them is because they drop not only some great treasure cards that you can sell for some decent money, but you also get mega snacks from Harvest. Now, pet snacks are basically what you feed to your pet to get experience for them to level up. Pet snacks are gonna be what makes your pet good, and pets are very important. Pet training is extremely important and incredibly expensive, but again, we'll get that in a second. With a regular chocolate donut, a regular schmegular pet stack, it's gonna take a lot of mini games to get your pet, even from baby to teen. It takes, I believe, 125 experience to get from baby to teen, and this only gives you four per mini game. That's ridiculously low. It's gonna take so much time, but with a mega snack, the difference is unreal. This is a Captain Cantaloupe dropped by the couch potatoes here. Look at the difference, 15, 18, 12. That's 45. You get four from one mini game run through from a chocolate donut. You get 45 from a Captain Cantaloupe. Would well, take you like 20 to 30 runs of a mini game with a chocolate donut takes you maybe three with a Captain Cantaloupe. Get couch potatoes, get Captain Cantaloupe. It's a huge deal. It will help you so much with pet trading, which again is extremely important. It's bolded and capitalized for a reason. Getting in to some other pretty important, but not necessary side modes, crafting. You get a lot of great gear sets from crafting. That's the facts. For example, the uh, Winter Tusk crafted gear is very good. The Dragoon gear at level 130, very good, but we're not gonna get too far into you know, level 130 stuff. The reason I say it's pretty important, but by no means necessary is because it's really expensive and really grindy, especially if you are just starting out. You gotta farm for regents, you gotta farm for gold. It is pricey and it takes a lot of time to do. So crafting gets you some great gear, but there's generally replacements at around the same level that will do you just fine. So you don't need to do crafting. It is helpful if you do it, but you don't need to do it. Fishing is a much lower investment side mode, but is great for gold. In the first arc, especially those first like three to four worlds, you get so little gold naturally. From questing, from mobs, you don't get a lot of gold. Sure, you have to spend a little bit to get the uh, fishing spells, but you will be very much rewarded with a lot of money. From level one, 250 especially, I very, very highly recommend it being the energy dump until you get to gardening. And even once you start gardening, uh, uh, use the remaining energy you have to dump into fishing because fishing will get you a lot of money and money's important. Be on the lookout for free fishing weekend. If it's free fishing weekend and you're a member, you don't have to spend any energy on fishing at all. So you can go to the housing castle tour building in the commons. You can visit a Polarian shipwreck or you can visit a dark war manor and you can make exorbitant amounts of money in just a couple of hours from fishing. I did it in my permadeath playthrough to hatch a pet as soon as I could. It's really gonna help you with that. Monstrology is in its own category category because it's not that good. It's initially useful, <laughs> crazy expensive. My personal favorite thing to get, and this is a free thing to get as well, basically just to give a short explanation of how Monstrology works, you basically enchant your regular hits with extract blank cards and every mob has a type. To extract animus from a lot of these uh, monsters costs money because you have to pay for the card to get them. The undead one is given to you for free. And if you extract enough animus, you can craft treasure cards that you can summon and you can summon that mob as a minion essentially. It's a bit grindy, but there are some things you can get for free. The frost bones in Winter Tusk are free and they are pretty good treasure cards because they spam tower shields and they're pretty nice. Now for gear, what gear do you need? From level five to 25, Bazaar is your best bet. That's where we're gonna be finding most of your best gear. Look for class exclusive gear every five levels, but there's one real exception that you could grind for if you wanted to. Again, not necessary. The hard steel dropped by Prince Gobblestone in Colossus Boulevard. It gives you five res. You don't have a lot of res for the first 30 or so levels of the game. Res is hard to come by. If you wanna grind for that, it will do a lot for you. But again, no means is that necessary. Once you get to level 30 though, the first grindable, gear dropping dungeon is here. It's Mount Olympus. It's a tough dungeon. It is a very tough dungeon, but you can almost always find a team to help you do it. It is the best free gear till around level 50. That is 20 levels of use. It's going to take probably 15 to 20 like Zeus fights at the final boss to really get the full set. It might take you less. It might take you more. It depends on the person and the RNG, but goddamn, it's worth it if you feel like doing it. Do it at least once. Do it at least once because the best want in the game until level 90, the Sky Iron Hosta is given to you for free in that dungeon. No RNG, you are 100% guaranteed to get it. It is, in my opinion, let's get a picture of this motherfucker up here, huh? It is a contender, in my opinion, for the best pound for pound piece of gear ever released into the game ever. Because you get 60 levels of use to do it, sometimes even 70. You're guaranteed a three pip opening, gives you a free power pit, which is nice, but most wands do that at that point of the game. But the 10% damage is crazy, crazy, crazy good. That's a lot. It might almost, for some schools, double the amount of damage your gear was giving you before. I even have a 
a sub note that says unbelievable because it is crazy. But Sky and Hosta aside, you can find some bizarre upgrades in the 50s. The Ring of Battle, I think, is an important note. You get around level 56. It gives you school specific damage on top of the other stats that rings give you. It's very nice. I highly recommend picking one of these up in the bazaar at some point. The Winter Tusk Crafting Gear, again, if you did crafting, you'll get rewarded because you get it at level 56 and it is very good. For some schools, it's optimal over even Waterworks, which is a dungeon grind for at level 60, depending on what you want to go for, depending on what your school is, and depending on if you did crafting or not. One of these two sets is what you're going to be carrying until level 90 to 100. So I'd really recommend either grinding Waterworks or getting crafting through to get the level 56 Winter Tusk Crafted Gear. These both are going to take time. Just pick your poison in that regard. Next up, we're going to gold. We're moving on. Gold and how to spend it. Gold doesn't come easy unless you do fishing. So how do you spend it in the first start? Well, for the most part, I'm going to recommend that you don't. Don't spend that much of your gold. Save most of it. And the thing you're saving most of your gold for is pet breeding because it's expensive and it's hella important. I'm not going to tell you to save all your gold. Obviously, you got to spend some of it when it's necessary. And here are the necessary purchases, in my opinion. Gear upgrades from level 5 to level 25. Gardening spells, just basically the stuff you'll need to <laughs> farm couch potatoes. A Thames rings, amulets throughout the game. Also recommend. I think for ice, I would recommend the Arc Mastery. Uh, I forget what gem it's called. It's either an opal or it's the tear shade one. I don't remember which it is. But get an Arc Mastery jewel from the jewel vendor in uh, the shopping district if you're ice in specific. I don't think the other schools really need this gem or this jewel or whatever you call it. Not the thing that the kids smoke in the bathroom in middle school, but the, the you know, the mineral. I don't think most schools need it uh, before level 50. And once you hit level 50, you get some innate Arc Mastery rating anyway. I think ice might if you go for the Seder route first because waiting to get a heal can be a pain in the ass. You can buy a permanent melt with gold from Prospector Zeke if you want to do that. But now that we have gold out the way, let's get into the thing you're going to be saving most of your gold for head training. The good, uh, the bad, and the ugly, because this side mode has a lot of good, a lot of bad, and a lot of ugly. Let's start with the bad and the ugly here. The hatches are expensive. They can range from 75,000 gold to well over 100,000. If you are a new player who is using the kiosk, most of us, let's face it, aren't gonna have a ton of friends that can give us great pets for much cheaper prices. If you're starting out, you're gonna have to use the kiosk. 75K to well over 100,000, it's a lot of money, a lot of money, especially for the first arc of the game. And in the worst part, the worst part about it, it generally takes five plus hatches to get a perfect pet. And to do this optimally, basically, you're gonna breed your trash starter pet with a pet that you want. But what makes a pet worth breeding? Well, you're going to want to choose a pet for your school that gives you a blade so you can stack it with your regular blade, cause zero pips, and it's very helpful and very useful and very good. Talent wise, triple double pets are in right now. We're talking triple damage, double res. That's the meta at this moment in time. I think it's very useful. That's what I personally try to build for. Another thing you have to keep in mind is pet stats, and they do matter, particularly three of them matter strength, agility, and power. Be sure that these stats are capped. And this is what a fully built pet looks like right here. Just to give you some information on what you're grinding for. 24 extra damage. That is a lot of damage. 15% res. Again, a lot of res. More than some pieces of gear, even later in the game, are going to give you. It's a big deal. Pet <laughs> training is very strong. It's a big deal. Let's look at the difference between capped and uncapped pets. This is a pet that is capped, particularly capped strength, capped agility, capped power. A pet that is not capped here, not capped strength, not capped agility, not capped power. And it's very close. It's a difference of percent. It's not a huge deal. And I am an advocate for in the early game, you only really hatch a few times. The optimal way to do it, if you're like somebody who's very far in the game and it has a lot of resources, very affluent and gold and whatnot, is to hatch like five times, get those babies to adult, and then just keep hatching until you get maybe to a fifth or sixth generation pet and then try and actually raise it to see if it'll fail. When you're in the start of the game, let's face it, you're not gonna have that much gold to do that. If you Even if you get a scuffed pet that is half good, that doesn't have completely min max stats, that will help you a ton. Let's look at an example of the pet that I used in my permadeath run, Colonel Peanut. You know him, you love him if you've been watching the permadeath run. Not a optimal pet whatsoever. I mean, look at that agility. Look at that power. We got problems. It's not a optimal pet by any means. Even the talents aren't optimal. There's triple damage. That's not bad, but only spell proof. No spell defy. I failed and got cheeky. Failed at mega. But even though Colonel Peanut failed at mega, and even though these stats aren't completely optimal, it still is very helpful. I get an extra set blade. I get Leaf Storm, which is huge for life characters. And it gives you still extra damage, extra universal resistance. That's a big deal at any point in the game, especially early on. So I'd recommend just doing two or three hatches, hatch till you get the pet that you want, level it up. And if the talents are workable, just stick with that and slowly save up gold to hatch further in the future if you so desire. You're gonna want a really min-max pet once you get to the later ends of the game. Uh, for this point though, you don't need it. The bonus slide, we've made it to the bonuses. Crowns, we're gonna go over crowns real quick. The real uh, money currency, you spend real money out of your wallet, your Benjamin Franklin's on some in-game currency. However, there are some ways to get this stuff for free. King's Lyle 
is this? I don't see people talk about these very much, probably because either it is a relic lost to time or because it's just not a lot of crowns in general. It's very tedious, but I just wanted to put it out there that it can be done. You can do 10 quizzes. If you pass them, you get 10 crowns. There are plenty of quizlets to guarantee that you'll pass and they have all the answers on there, much like your tests in college. You can get 10 crowns for passing one. You can do 10 of them a day, up to hundred free crowns a day. You can get some packs. It only takes four days of doing all of them to get a pack, like a professor's sword pack or something. If you want good gear at around level 50 without farming for it and you want to roll with that, go for it. Sometimes they have the uh, feature where you can watch ads for crowns, but uh, it's not always offered. It comes and goes. And I also wanted to go over when to start playing the game. Now, this is kind of a weird question because I, I, you would assume that it would be uh, whenever I want, but there is ways to save some money. A few months out of the year, Kings Isle will make memberships for the first arc completely free. You don't have to pay any money. You can do uh, Wizard City of Dragon Spire completely for free. You can begin the game, see if you like it without spending any money. That's pretty nice. It happens mostly around the holidays. Sometimes we'll do it a month out of the summer. They may even do it this summer. Who knows? But if this isn't up, first time memberships can also be discounted by about $5. Take a look out for those. Keep the eyes peeled. Those are probably the two best times to start out playing. You think it's literally $5 right now? Good time to start. It's here right now in April, the month of April, as I am recording this, as I'm likely uploading it, 50% off memberships. You want to try it now. This is a good time. This is all the information from one to 50. I think you'll need to do very, very well to set yourself up for success and make the first arc as painless as possible. But I do want to include one last slide in here. Just fucking have fun playing. You don't got to listen to any of the shit I just said. If you don't want to just have fun, play how you want to. If you want to spend your training points on, on fire spells as a nice wizard and do a fire and ice playthrough, go for it. Be my guest. Games are played to have fun. It's not a fucking job. It's not a test. Play the game however you want to play it and enjoy playing. Hey folks, if you like this video and want some more Wizard 101 content, I'm currently trying to beat the game without dying or also delete my character. I uh, don't think I'll actually beat the game, but hey, you never know unless you give it a watch. Thanks for getting to the end of the video and hopefully I'll see you next time.